Welcome, welcome, everybody. Hello, 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 as we are populating, populating. Oh, my gosh, so many people. Oh, my Two papers goodness. right from the start. Um, hey, everybody, welcome to the VO Dojo's Ask the Sensei. Um, I'm Tish Hicks. I'm the Master Sensei um, here in Burbank, California. Kelsey V is here as our team member facilitating the calls. Um, this is a free call that we do once a month, um, usually on the first Wednesday of the month, if you want to put it on your calendar. Um, we had a feeling people might be having some feelings last Wednesday, so we yeah. gave it a little moment to settle in. Um, yeah, but uh, we this is an opportunity um, where I I bring an esteemed voiceover colleague or colleagues in in, our, in this case to join me each month to be here to answer your questions. So we are here to answer any questions that you have that might be moving you forward in whatever you're doing in your voiceover career. Um, hopefully everyone had a chance to take in our Dojo 21 questions, which is an interview we do before these events so that you can get some uh, questions that you might have about our uh, guest senseis answered. Um, Karen and I had a lovely 21 dojo 21 questions so if you haven't caught that um we can make sure you have the link to the replay so we are here today for you so uh i'll do a little uh we'll have karen and oh and, and who's with us today doink um <laughs> doink we are joined today by our audiobook sensei ronnie butler who's an um, amazing um brilliant talented narrator and extraordinary um audiobook educator as well and karen jakonski who is from penguin random house um we'll have them introduce themselves um and then uh we'll take your questions um you can put your questions in the chat and then we'll call we'll call your voice into the room and as we get started, and as uh, Karen and Ronnie are introducing themselves, why don't we have you guys, oh, you're already doing it, say where you are. And um, we'd also love to hear, you know, if you are an audiobook narrator, um, you know, how many books have you worked on? If you haven't, you know, if, if you're just starting out, let us know that. But where are you on your audiobook journey or uh, if, if, uh, if, if it, 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 we don't have to only answer questions about audiobooks obviously um obviously we have two audiobook experts here so if it is audiobook centric that's okay but if you have questions about anything happy to answer um so karen and ronnie welcome welcome thank you so much for being here hi thank you for having me it's great to be here yeah. No, did Ronnie did Ronnie drop off for a second? No, I'm here. I switched. Oh, there you are. I was like, wait, where is he? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we have you guys uh introduce yourselves? Uh tell us what, what we need and want to know. Karen, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Karen Jakonski. I am the VP of audio production at Penguin Random House Audio, which means I produce audiobooks. And I work with a team of producers that produce audiobooks. And in 2025, I will have been doing this for 25 years. It's absolutely astounding to think about. Um, but I've loved working in the audiobook industry. It's changed so much throughout the years. So it's always interesting and exciting. Um, I love working with authors on um, creating, bringing their vision for their audiobooks into the audio realm. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today. I met with Tish last week. We were introduced by uh, Fabian Cook, who was my um, mentee. We have a mentorship program at Penguin Random House Audio. And um, from the first moment we met, he's been talking about the VO Dojo. So I'm really excited to finally connect with Tish and Ronnie and Kelsey and all of you here today. So thanks for having me. Awesome. And how about you, Ronnie? Tell us about all your goodness. Good morning. I'm Ronnie Butler, and um, I am a 
full-time audiobook narrator. Uh, I have about, I, I'm guessing, because I haven't, I stopped counting at about 400, but I think I'm probably close to 500 at this point, titles under my belt. Um, I uh, was a, a theater actor long ago in New York and then film and TV in LA and actually um, fell into audiobooks as opposed to any other uh, form of voiceover. Um, and uh, fell in love with it and have been doing it full time for about 12 years. Um, and I teach um, an, a, any number of teach and coach any number of classes, the main ones being here at, at the dojo for uh, people that are looking to get into audiobooks and that are looking to make demos. And then, of course, um, continuing their journey. So um, I'm happy to be here. I'm always happy to be here and, and answer questions. And say hello to some of the people in the crowd who I've coached and who are actually we're working with right now. Good morning. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's it's always good to come together. Um, all right. So, um, Kelsey, what questions do what questions do we have? So far, we got everyone saying they're from everywhere. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so my question actually is to start us off um Karen as we were talking about earlier I think it'd be interesting to know what is a way that you can get into audiobooks if you're someone who maybe isn't the best as, at production I think that's a great thing for people to know yeah, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before everyone hopped on the call. Um, you know, I can talk a little bit about from the perspective of working for Penguin Random House Audio. Um, I know that audiobooks are being produced in all different kinds of ways across the industry and narrators, actors are doing a lot. They're, they're not only performing, they're engineering, they're self-directing. And they're also um, editing and providing the, the finished master to either the publisher or the author. Um, in my day-to-day -day work um, at Penguin Random House, we work with actors um, who, who perform the audiobook. And they're supported by directors who work alongside them. Um, and then we work with the team of, of freelance editors who um, handle post-production. So I would say to start by trying to work in that way where you're just building up credits, having just performed and narrated a title where, you know, someone else handles the post-production and then take your time and learn the skills involved in, in how to do the post-production aspect of it. We have um, a casting website that you can check out is called ahabtalent.com. You can put up a profile with some samples and tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, we have about 20 producers on staff who are using Ahab um, to cast audiobooks and hold auditions. Um, and that could be a good way to get some visibility with the Penguin Random House audio producers. Mm -hmm. I know I know one or two people whose first audiobook was with Penguin Random House via the Ahab Talent website. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, it's 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 an incredible resource. Um mm -hmm. I I would say that you know it um the skill set or the ability to do the post production um varies. I I've I've never done post on a book. Um and the few times that I have done books, the few independent titles that I've done, when I say independent, I mean when I've worked directly with an author, um, whether that is through ACX or through a direct relationship, mm -hmm. I have I have outsourced the post-production, you know, and I built that into my price that I charge um, because I, I I don't have the bandwidth for the learning curve of it. And and it's a and if you do, I say you go for it. That's more money in your pocket. You know, um, but there are um, the majority of uh, producing houses and publishers that you work for will will only have you submit raw audio. They're not going to they're not going to require you to do any post production. It's only when you work for independent authors 
and and um, some independent producers that you would do that. And I know many narrators who make a, a, a very viable living working only in that manner. And some of them do the post and some of them, some of the out, them outsource it. Yeah, there are definitely different levels and layers to production and what narrators are asked to do. Um, just looking at Amanda's question um, in the chat, what's the minimum tech required to get cast at PRH? Uh, the minimum tech is um, probably no tech. You know, the minimum <laughs> tech is either recording at home, um, you know, connecting with the director over Zoom and um, recording uh, a straight record. Um, if actors are comfortable with the punch record or self-directing for us, then they do a punch and then just uploading files to, to an editor um, who will handle the, the post-production. Yeah. yeah, who's next, Kels? All right, awesome. Moving right along, we have uh, Irida Funk. Is that right? <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question was, Given the evolution of narrative styles, and, and do you see an evolution and a change in that, given how quickly voiceover has changed and the technology has changed? Or do you feel the narrative styles tend to stay pretty constant? Mm, I, I, maybe you could clarify a little bit. I mean, my, my first thought is that the narrative style really depends on the on the, the story that needs to be told? It and, does, yeah. most definitely it does. Um, in, in a more generalized sense, nonfiction versus fiction, um, how much you get into the acting of the characters mm -hmm. versus the telling. And I know a lot of that is guided by whether or not it's written um, third person point of view or first person point of view. I'm just curious as to whether or not you've seen that evolve as time has gone on and uh, AI has developed and do you um, see any I, trends there? I'm not really thinking about any trends that are that are coming to mind. I tend to just take it book by book okay. and talk to, but I know what you mean about the different narration styles in terms of nonfiction. Like, are you talking about our narrators acting or giving character voices to nonfiction when there's dialogue mm -hmm. um you know that's that you've got to get a feel for the book and how it reads off the page and then I think talk to the author and the narrator about how to approach the material so I don't think I have a great answer for you but I'm not really I'm not noticing a trend um okay. in narrative styles um right that that I can think of because we do kind of approach it uh, project by project mm -hmm. thanks I don't know if Ronnie has has a sense of of, of anything different I I no, uh, no in fact and I'm I'm I I love hearing you say that because I I I feel the same way I I do think that maybe 15 years ago um, or longer that the the uh, there was an idea that that the book was read um and I mm -hmm. think now now the idea is the book is performed mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that's that's the audience expectation um is that they're not just going to have someone sit and and sort of passively read to them but they're going to engage more with the, engage with the material and bring it to life and I think that is definitely a shift but that that I think happened a while ago now it's a matter of their people people bring their own style and their own sense of artistry to the book as well as you know I think putting the the author's intentions first you know as Karen said and the creative team together decides what you know what is what is what is the tone you know, and, and, and what is the style and how do, how do I interpret that when I'm in the booth? Yeah. And I think, I think that that's something interesting as we, as, um, narrators, <clears throat> um, how, how do we serve each, how do we serve each title? But then that becomes like, oh, that becomes, you know, if you, ha if you listen to certain narrators, like, oh, 
this is how Scott Brick sound like this is a Scott Brick sound and he interprets books gorgeously and you can tell which books are narrated by him as opposed to somebody else might have a different style that so each of us as narrators can be aware of what becomes our way of of interpreting a book and that is what we get to know I, I don't know what do you think about that Ronnie and Karen How, do you feel like that's something that is um uh, uh, we as narrators would be cultivating and developing Sure, absolutely. I think that, you know, one of the joys of casting an audiobook is seeing what you having an idea of what a narrator can bring to it, but also, you know, listening to the end result and hearing what, what they do with the material, uh, how mm -hmm. they make it um, special for the listener. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the joys in, uh, of the job, for sure, is, is that collaboration. And, and putting a book into the hands of an actor and, and seeing what they do with it. Mm -hmm. It's quite a responsibility, you know, for, for, an, for the narrator, because, you know, once you get the book, you get the book and, and there's no, there's no sort of interim check-in four hours through or six hours through. So there's an incredible amount of trust that's given and belief in, in your artistry and in your, in your abilities because you know you're given something that's 10 hours long and once they give it to you that's it you know so um yeah it's 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 a, it's quite um the word i want to use it's it's quite a it's it's quite a compliment and and you know when you're invited to collaborate because you're 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 really being asked to 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 take care of the baby you know mm -hmm. yeah 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 um and I think I think more and more in how the world is working that audiobooks more and more is how people are receiving their literature, um, or you know a lot of people who a lot more people are receiving their literature in this way. So it's it's a responsibility to the author and to the art form, right? Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. Good, 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 and the publisher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, what's next, Kels? All right, uh, Casey Finnegan, come on up. Good morning slash afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, hello, Karen and Ronnie. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, so I'm, I've been doing this uh, for about fourteen months. I'm working on my ninth and tenth titles right now, all through ACX. Um, the <clears throat> excuse me, one of them I'm working on right now is part of a trilogy. When I was originally reaching out to the author, he was still considering whether or not to make it a um, like a, a narrator team project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, ultimately, he decided against it because there were only two female characters and 40 male characters. Um but when working in a situation like that, how do you manage two different narrators on the same project, especially when coming from an independent background where we may not have the option of sharing the same studio space or going to a, a you know, professional booth? Um, how does that, how do you balance that? Well, when we have multiple narrators on, on, titles we handled it in in a bunch of different ways again it really depends on what the material calls for um sometimes we have everybody in the same room performing together live um sometimes narrators are just doing wilds and and, and we're kind of editing handling all of the integration and assembly in post um and sometimes the narrators are don't really interact in the text. So they narrate separately. And we just, again, assemble it and, and edit it together in post. The nature of these programs, is it like, what would it be? Would it be uh, people like in the same room or are they talking in, to in, each other? Is it like a full cast? No, it would have been 
um, it would have been a duo. And I think the intention was for me to do all the male characters and the person who we decided, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, we didn't do, he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the intention was for another a female narrator to do mm -hmm. the uh, female characters, but there would be interaction. Mm -hmm. There is dialogue between them. I mean, I would make a decision on, on how much. <laughs> um, and then I would probably either schedule session, have you read most of the book and then maybe isolate those sections where the dialogue happens and then schedule a session for you to record together or evaluate the text and see, okay, is this something that, you know, we can prep and talk about what the performances will be between the two people and then kind of have you do it separately and edit it together. Um, it, again, it depends on, on the text and I'd have to take a look at it, but there's different ways to do it. Um, when I worked on um, Angels in America, we had all the actors record separately, you know, because they had internalized their performances so much that they were able to just go in and, and perform their parts. And then an editor, you know, placed it, you know, pieced it all together. Um, so there's, this there's like an original cast kind of situation with that. Yeah. It was with like Andrew Garfield and Nathan Lane and the, the Broadway okay. cast from uh, 2017 or 2018. Um, so, you yeah, know, you could do it all different kinds of ways. It depends on, the actors, the text, what the author wants, um, what your editing capabilities are. And it, I think I think it's an interesting thing that comes up, the difference, the difference between working with a publishing house that has a team of producers that are thinking about the whole project together, that if you're working on independent things, then it might be you and the author or the right. author making those decisions so you i think you as a as a narrator need to ask the questions and then someone like it's it's a it's not as much of a uh or it's a different team like who is the team that's making, mm -hmm. making those decisions um because ultimately we're we're here to to serve the vision right and when we're given what like when, when ronnie was saying when we're given like all right serve the vision we would do something by ourselves. But if we're working collaboratively, then understanding who is making the decisions, how how is the artistic vision, how am I part of the artistic vision? Do you want my input on that? Or do you want to mm -hmm. tell me what's happening? Um, and um, can you can you talk a little, so so I think those are the things that as, as narrators, we need to know who and how we're working about. Can you talk a little bit about Karen, about how, production at a, at a big publishing house works like how who's who's on your team where do you fit uh like how how does how does the whole how does the whole um process work when you're working with random when you're working with penguin random house um the process is that the producers are kind of leading obviously the production and making the decisions um mm -hmm. assembling the team and the, the folks that are going to work on any given title. So um, casting every title, um, hiring a and deciding how it's going to be produced. Is it going to be a single voice? Is it going to be a multicast? You know, really working with the author to decide on a casting approach. Authors usually sign off on um, all of our casting suggestions. We hold a lot of auditions. Um, we analyze the text to make sure, you know, what are the needs? What will the narrator have to be able to do? Are there accents? Um, you know, there's any number of things before we actually get into production. And then once the title is cast, we're hiring um, a director who will also prep the book, um, create a pronunciation list and a list of questions for the author do the pronunciation research, talk to the actor in advance of the session to, well, along with the producer in most cases to kind of establish a, a game plan for the performance, make sure everyone's on the same page, so to speak. 
and then um, we have a department that schedules the recordings. Um, so actors are either using their home studios that if you, you're new to working with PRH would be vetted by our post-production team, um, or we're putting you at one of our own studios in New York or in LA or um, anywhere across the country or in the world and um, scheduling the recording and um, just checking in on how it's going. We get day-to-day -day reports from the director. We're always open for conversations with the actors during that process. Uh, then the program, the title gets edited by um, a freelance editors and editing houses that we work with. Um, pickups are being sent uh, daily to the studio so we can get as much as possible in the can during the primary recording. And then the title goes through quality control where um, a tech person is listening along with uh, following along with the PDF and filling out a sheet of any deviations from the script, any mispronunciations that they're catching or um, anything that they want to flag for the producer who then goes in and looks at the sheet and either approves things as they are or adds things to a list of um, for pickups. Um, and then we may call the actors back to do pickups. The program gets updated and finalized and spot checked and then gets delivered um, to our post-production team who then archive it and it goes out to our digital consumer team and sends it out to all of our digital retailers. Like that's it in a nutshell right there. In a nutshell, which is always, which is always why when, when ACX first came on the scene, I was like, I'm sorry, you want us to do what now? <laughs> um, wait a minute. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what was your second question, Casey? Um, second question. Uh, at, first off, let me say that listening and following with the PDF job sounds like fun. So <laughs> I don't know how to get into that, but that sounds entertaining. <laughs> um, my question is, because uh, like I said, I've only done uh, audio books so far. Uh, but I am interested in reaching into other areas in the voiceover market. When a company like PRH sees that, is that considered a a boon or a you know a, a negative against the individual? Not at all. I mean, I think voice actors are multifaceted. And some, a lot of the narrators we work with also do VO. Um, I'm, you know, so it doesn't even occur to me to think in a negative way um, about actors who are narrators who do multiple kinds of voiceover work. Uh, and okay, Ron, Ronnie, do you do you work in both? You you mostly just focus on in audiobooks, right? You you don't work in other bio realms or do you no when i first started in audiobooks i was doing i was still doing a little bit of commercial um mm -hmm. voice work uh but my real voiceover has been entirely audiobooks um i i, I do do some some subsets of audio so i do a lot of journalism uh mm -hmm. short form so i don't just do long form i also do articles for the new york times and mm -hmm. a variety of of magazines um so there's a there's a there's that yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't even I, know that was a niche market. How, where, where did you? How did it's you very discover niche. that? <laughs> um, um, they uh, they came to me. Um, there are a couple of different. There are a couple of different apps because everything is sort of app driven, right? So there was an app called Autumn A U D M, um, and they had a they were a startup and they had a contract with Condé Nast magazine. Um, Condé Nast Publications and the New York Times. And so they did audio for all the articles, for all the magazines that fell under Condé Nast and also for New York Times audio. The New York Times bought that company three years ago or two years ago um, and now owns and now that has been subsumed into the New York Times audio, which is an app that you can get. Um, and so I, I was one of, I was on the roster of Autumn before it was purchased by New York Times. And I was also on the roster of a company called Curio, which is based in London, which is something similar, but with more uh, financial oriented um, periodicals and newspapers and whatnot. Um, and 
I met them when they were a startup, literally they had, you know, they were in San Francisco doing a startup thing and they reached out to me because of my website. Um, so that's how I fell into those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the thing that my entrepreneurial mind goes like, get to people, get to know people when they're starting things because, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other thing about the, the doing both audiobooks and other forms of voiceover, I think the real thing that becomes the, um, the, the thing that needs to be taken into consideration is your availability. Because if you're, if you're focused on a book and you're in production and you're going into, into the, PRH studios to record a book with a director you're there for x amount of time for x amount of days and so if you have another session that comes up mm. how how do you navigate that um so it's it's just kind of um you know I think I think the answer is always say yes until it's time to say no and figure out how how the two go together right um just understand that I think there's so much more flexibility with audiobooks now that you could be working from home and as long as you're meeting your deadlines and everything's hitting, then you have autonomy on when and how yeah. you're doing it, which is different than when you are a team and you're going to the studio and this is this is what you're doing this week. Um, yeah. What are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, it's just hearing you talk makes me remember there have been some times where... Um, I've booked an actor to narrate over the course of four days. And then closer to the first day, they have a VO um, spot a gig become, you know, available to them. And so, you know, I know that VO tends to be, you know, they don't want to miss out on that opportunity because maybe the VO is a little more lucrative than, um, you know, more bang for your buck. So mm -hmm. we make, you know, if we have flexibility, we, we try to accommodate and we start a little later or we take a longer lunch um, or we end a little earlier to accommodate them being able to do that job. Um, or like, like you said, I mean, if they're recording at home, then they can just step away and, you know, they're not kind of on the clock as much, mm -hmm. but we're pretty <laughs> realistic about, you know, um, we don't want to anybody to have to turn down a gig because uh you know when we have flexibility in the schedule that's cool and then the other thing to take into account when you're doing long form anything and anything else is your vocal health right if if you are you know if you're not if your stem if your vocal stamina is you know if you're still developing your vocal stamina and you come off you know many days of narration and then you need to do your regular, your regular, um, mm -hmm. you know, ongoing thing for a client or a video game, something or something. You just need to be make sure that you're taking care of your vocal instrument. It'd be the equivalent of um, uh, Ronnie was just talking about his pickleball championship, <laughs> pickleball <laughs> playoffs. You have the pickleball playoffs after you've run the the, the New York Marathon. Can you do it? Yes. Might your body be in a different place physically yeah so so those i think those are always always the things to be in balance yeah yeah i guess the actor really has to balance that out i remember talking mm -hmm. to january lavoy once about her instrument and how i mean she works so so much and she you just have to have an awareness of when you need to rest okay i'm not going to talk tonight after this session because i have three more days um so it's it's all a balancing act i guess right yeah how do you, how do you how do you navigate your your world as a vocal diva um a vocal marathoner actually you know not, not a vocal diva actually we're all vocal divas we should be vocal divas because this is our lives but um as a vocal marathoner how do you, how do you um how do you approach that Ronnie um I have I mean I think I have the the same um protocol as many people here would being a voiceover artist which is um, I mean, I, I, I know my limits. I know, you know, I'm, I'm at the point where I, I can, I can be in the booth for five or six hours a day for five days in a row and be okay. Um, but I can't, I can't go to a party or a bar or a nightclub and shout over, you know what I mean? I, I can't go to a conference. You know, I was at, I was at a, a romance conference a couple months ago and 
and I knew that I had to narrate the following Monday. And even though it was a, a Saturday, I was like, I'm shouting to be heard and I'm, I'm going to be useless for the first three days of next week. So I have to stop, you know, and a very clever narrator who was there had a, had a, had a, a setup where she had a headset and a, and a speaker hanging from her, from a chain <laughs> around her back. and she was talking into her headset and was being amplified in this party. And I thought that is brilliant. But that's like that. She she knows what she has to do in order to, you know, in order to take care of herself vocally. Um, if I, uh, I think if I had to do, if I was working on a video game, you know, the, which are notorious for being hard on your voice, um, that and and balance and juggling an audiobook, that would be that would be something that you have to really have to think about how you balance those two. But it's just really knowing your voice and knowing where you're at and what you can handle and then being really judicious about resting when you have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's keep on going with questions from from the team here, from the from Thank the you both very much. Yeah, sure. Great questions. Okay. I am going to usurp my power as a moderator here. Uh, we're already 40 minutes in, which is nuts. Um, we've had several questions about the Penguin House um, mentorship program, Karen. And I was wondering if you could give us more information on that, um, what it is, what you're looking in applicants um, mm -hmm. and things like that. Just expound upon it. Yeah, I mean, the Penguin Random House Mentorship Narrator Mentorship Program um, started in 2021. Um, I had nothing to do with it, but I've been uh, a very willing um, participant. Um, my colleagues, Dan Zitt and Kelly Gilday, um, started it um, in 2021 when they realized that we as a company really wanted to um, encourage newer audiobook narrators um, some of whom would be from underrepresented, underrepresented populations, um, to give them the skills that they would need in order to kind of open the door into audiobook narration. We started um, with two classes a year, and then we kind of downgraded um, to one class a year and kind of built out that program. But basically, um, there's an application process where um, applicants um, answer a few questions about themselves and submit about a three minute um, audiobook narration clip that highlights um, their skills. And we're not looking for professional level stuff. We're just looking for a sense of um, who you are as a narrator, what you could bring to the program and areas that where we could help. So we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for people who really have potential to excel um, in, in, in this format. Um, what else? So we, we, one of the requirements is that you have fewer than 10 audiobook credits um, to your name. So sometimes we have had to turn away folks who have more than, than 10 audiobook credits. So it's really for new, new narrators looking to break into the industry. And then um, I think I said before, we have about 20 producers on staff. And so we are um, working with 20 uh, mentees um, as part of the program who are assigned um, a producer mentor. And they meet several times over the course of about six months and develop a rapport. And there are goals, you know, to um, create a demo, really kind of hone in on the genres that might best represent their skills in audio, um, select some demo um, pieces, and then go into the studio and record court, record those selections, and then create a, a profile on ahabtalent.com, which is our casting um, platform. Um, we also talk about the industry and the business, and we try to make connections for them with other publishers and um, just kind of paint a picture of, of what it's like to be an audiobook narrator working today. 
Um, I think we offer um, the first year of membership to the Audio Publishers Association. We sponsor that for the mentees and we show them all the resources kind of available to um, narrators uh, throughout the industry. So it's really, I kind of think of it as like opening the door to this kind of work. Um, we've had a lot of success with hiring the mentees. I think we've had close to a hundred mentees so far. And uh, I think 80% have narrated audiobooks. Um, I just hired one of our uh, mentees from last session to uh, narrate a romance title for me. Um, and, um, you know, it's nice created really nice bonds with the mentees. Um, we're entering, I think, our fifth class. Um, we just closed, um, I, I saw it in the chat, we just closed um, the application process and um, we're in the reviewing period of all the applications that for the class that will start in January or so early next year. So um, about a year from now, I think, I think in August of 2025, that we'll be looking, we'll be opening up the application process for 2026. And I think Kelsey, you posted the, the link um, to the website and it's also um, posted on our social channels when the application process is going to um, open up again, pr probably August of, of next year. So it opens in August and um, closes in October? Or... Yeah, uh, closes probably in September or so. Oh, in September. Yeah. Okay. And then you review. And, yeah, and then, yeah, it takes, we get a lot of applications. Um, I think this time we had about 1,200 applications for, for 20 okay. spots. So um, we have a whole team of producers reviewing the, the applications and making their recommendations and then a smaller team of, of producers making the final um, selections for the for the upcoming class. Yeah, and it was exciting. It was exciting for me to hear from Fabian that of the 20 in the last class, three people were from from the dojo and had worked with Ronnie and had worked with the dojo. I mean, so that's that amazing. Like yeah, really super. Yeah. Really super cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, love, love that you guys take the time and create the opportunity. It's really, really a powerful thing. It's um, one of the best parts of the job. It's yeah. a great evolution of of being a producer at a big publisher, being able to to participate in this program has been um just fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I know uh, Kelsey's putting uh, things in the chat about about that. Um, we usually at the 45 minute mark talk about what's happening at the dojo, but it seems like it could be a lot a logical segue to um, the fact that Ronnie is we, we do a, we work with Ronnie several times a year. We have you should do audiobooks one that is coming up in December. And once you've done, you should do audiobooks one, then we have, you should do audiobooks two, which is about putting your awesome demo together. But Ronnie, yeah. you want to just say a little tiny bit before we get back to questions about what happens and you should do audiobook one and, and then sure. subsequently yeah. two, but how, how you approach, how you approach, um, how you approach uh, bringing people and their talent to this realm so that they're able to be ready to be working with places like um with with people like Karen at places like Penguin Random House how do you how do you approach that I uh I look at the the level one as sort of a, a soup to nuts education because a lot of times people coming coming in have maybe they've done one book or two books or they're familiar with ACX or they've heard about audiobooks but they don't have um a complete understanding of the industry you know Karen just broke down, for example, the production process and the team and, and all the components. And, um, and so um, in, in level one, it's, uh, it's two-pronged. It's an education about the business of audiobooks, including not just, how, not just all the players, um, but also the tools that you need to participate in the business, like what are the expectations of, of demos and, and where they should live and who you should contact and what are the different organizations to belong to that can, can, can open doors for you. 
Um, you know, the we mentioned the PRH mentorship program, the APA has a mentorship program. So half half of it is business and how you can and understanding the business of audiobooks and where you can look to find opportunities and plug in. And the other half is performance, um, uh, focusing on the long form nature of storytelling, right? And trying to focus on each individual's each individual's talent of storytelling and um, letting that sort of uh, fostering um, their particular strengths to blossom um, and bringing out sort of their best storyteller. And, you know, spending time doing at least three or four sessions where, 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 each, person get, where each person gets to work three or four times during the course of that um, to practice that in, in different genres and also making recommendations about which genres seem to work for them and which kind of story seems to work for them. So it really is sort of a... Um, an intensive deep dive into the world of audiobooks. And then mm -hmm. level two, which is going on right now, and some of um, my lovely narrators are here in this room, is about, okay, okay, we're ready to dive in. We want to do this. Picking out material. We talk about how to, I'm sorry, in level one, we talk about how to pick out material, what makes each narrator unique, um, what makes you unique, and trying to find material that reflects that uniqueness so that when people like Karen are listening to your demos, they are, you're, you're telling them who you are and how they can use you um, by the material that you've selected. And so uh, we do that in, in level one. So in level two, people go out and they bring um, anywhere from three to five or more pieces. And we work on that over the course of the month, developing, honing those pieces, getting them just right. And so that they're ready to dive in. And then the last day, which I think is next week, um, mm -hmm. then we'll spend uh, a, a whole a whole day simply on marketing, you know, who to send them to, how to send them, how to how to how to write a cold email for 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 someone you've never worked for before. Um, what web what your website needs, you know, navigating Ahab talent, all those kinds of things. And that's it. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll give you more information about that, but this is also how we're here for you. Um, thanks. Thanks, Ronnie. And um it's a powerful, powerful experience. It's it's good. Um, so we've got about 11, 10 more minutes before we're officially, officially um, complete. We like to start and finish in an hour because I know this is the middle of the day. So um, if you need to roll, um, you can um, touch base with anyone at the at the dojo uh, and talk to me about um, voiceover once-overs, um, and if you're interested in anything with the um, audiobooks, um, it's on the website, so Kelsey will put those things. And then if you need to roll at the top of the hour, um, that's cool. Um, uh, Karen and Ronnie, I think you said you have a couple more minutes if we have more questions, mm -hmm. so we'll we'll kind of go a little bit over, uh, a little bit over, like maybe 15 minutes to get some of these great questions answered. So if you're feeling like, oh, we don't have much time and there's so many questions, um, it's okay. So we'll go over and if you need to roll, we'll get the replay. So, um, yeah. And uh, uh, Kelsey, who's next? What, what other questions do we have? Um, okay. So next we have Leo Goodman. Yay, Leo. Hello. Come in. Um, so when, when working on a fiction book, like that has many characters, how important is it for each voice to, to, vo to have, to have unique voices and accents for each one? Or is it okay if a lot of them kind of end up sounding somewhat similar, as long as you can tell who's talking when they're talking to each other? I'm going to let Karen go first on that one. <laughs> but I will, I will chime in. I hate to sound like a broken record, but it, to me, it really depends on the book and the style. Um, but I think as a producer, my expectation for fiction is that every character has a distinct sound based on how the author portrays them in the text. Um, but I also don't like a very heavy accent. You know, I like a, a slight shading. I like the essence of the character to come through. Um, 
but yeah, I think acting, I really like to hear the acting of, you know, and what narrators can do. Um, Ronnie, tell me you agree with me. I do. I do agree with you. Okay. And I, I think, I think, uh, you know, and, 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 um, how I like to work and how I like to coach people is that um, you start with intention, right? You start with understanding the differences, the differences between all the characters, say in a particular in a particular scene or in a particular book and what their objective is in the book, in the story. And you start from that yeah. place, place of differentiation, right? And then to the extent that, that, that any external things are, are suggested or demanded by the text, like a British accent, an Irish accent, something like that, then you have to add that on top. But that comes after you're very yeah. clear what everybody wants and how everybody's navigating. Yeah. Now, if you get your, when you, and you, and it will happen when you have a book where there are six or eight people sitting around a dinner table talking, then you're going to have to do more. You're going to have to do more in that situation in order for people to be di differentiated, I believe. But once again, I agree with Karen. It's, it's the it's what the text demands. What does the text demand? Um, and that's something that unfortunately you learn by doing it. And the more you do it, the more you learn, oh, here's a place where it, I don't need it as much. Here's a place where I need it a lot, you know? Um, and it's also something that you can ask the production team. They'll, they'll be more than happy to give you feedback yeah. on that particular thing, you know? Um, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a solo thing. And, and in fact, oftentimes if I get a sample, um, if I get a, a request for an audition or request for a sample, um, I will, I will ask specifically, okay, this says this person is from this part of the world. How much of a, how, how much of an accent do you want? Or how much differentiation do you want? Because different, the, the truth is a different producers and publishers also have different aesthetics. Yeah. Right. Some people want it really close and, and nothing at all. Other people are like, go for it big, you know? <laughs> um, so that's a part of the business too, is, is knowing that you can ask those questions. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to think you, in fact, they're going to appreciate that you've asked. It's going to, it's going to sound like, you know what you're doing to get that feedback and then incorporate that into the work that you do. I mean, think about the Harry Potter audiobooks and what Jim Dale Dale. did with all of those hundreds of characters and the notes that he took and he had a cassette player I remember hearing the stories about him in the studio and he would record the voice and then stop and when the character came up again he'd play a little bit of that character just to kind of get back into that character voice but he created a whole world for listeners and I mean that's what narrators are doing and I think they bring so much when they just give the characters, the layers, and, and and just the personalities that they're meant to have in audio. Um, and I think listeners really grab onto that kind of performance too, especially for fiction. I mean, a hundred percent. Well, and I think Harry Potter universe is, is such an interesting place because um, there's two, two extraordinary versions of it. Right. The early Stephen Fry and Stephen Fry is an oh my gosh brilliant mm -hmm. narrator that is more in the style of of telling mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. And then Jim Dale is just an absolute master master class in creating specific voices. So that's a really that's a really good little um um you know master's degree program mm -hmm. that you can give yourself <laughs> in in narration. Mm -hmm. Listen to Stephen Fry, listen to Jim Dale, compare and contrast what is your style. And I, th I think there's also something about, I think as narrators, when we're in the book, that um, we are wearing so many hats. Like we we are, we've been cast, but we need to cast, we need to be the casting director. We need to be the casting director within ourselves of like, okay, that's Uncle Harry and that, you know, like we need to cast all these characters ourselves. We need to be the, um, one of my uh, seminal, seminal anchors in my own narration um, and my, my training, getting to work with the amazing Christina Rooney. She always mm -hmm. instilled, we are the voice of the author. We represent the author. So we have that. Then we're, we're the director, we're the performer, 
we're all the things. And then we also need to make sure that we're responsible for is what we're doing coming through to the reader, to the listener, uh, is is because so we can be doing all sorts of fancy stuff. What is the experience of who's listening? Are they right. receiving it? Because it's not about us; it's about them. So, it's just my my two cents. <laughs> all true, all true. It's a heavy, it's a heavy lift for the actor. Yeah. But exciting. Like that's, mm -hmm. I think that's what, you know, some people are like, Oh, I'll just sit in a, sit in a box and read. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> that's not what you're doing. Yes. Yes. That's what you're doing. But so much else is going on. Yeah. Um, awesome. What other, well, let's, let's do one more question and then we'll wrap up officially and then we'll do our after, after party or our after party. Um, okay. So next is, um, Kathy Verduin. Kathy. Hi, how are you? Uh, my question, I think, is for both Karen and Ronnie. Uh, I was just curious, in order to get into a big publishing house like PRH, and as a narrator, do you need to be union or does it or non-union or either one? Um, I think for one or two jobs with PRH, non-union would be okay, but um, we do pay everybody through a paymaster who would then send you like a form, you know, and, and, and kind of encourage you to join the union. But mostly I have to be on, we work with union actors and we have an agreement um, with the union through this, this third party paymaster. Okay, and I, I guess that's the way most of the large publishing houses work through union? Um, I believe so. I did work at Harper, and we, we did work that way as well, yeah. Yeah, okay. most, of the, most of the major publishers pay through a paymaster, and mm -hmm. all the, the paymasters have contracts. They are SAG signatory yeah. masters. So they're paying you. So even if you're non-union, you're getting paid the union scale um, mm -hmm. minimum for, for the audiobook. And I also know that after one, I, I believe, and uh, don't quote me, but I, I, I'm pretty sure this is true, that you only have to do one audiobook to qualify for, um, mm. for SAG if, you are no, if you're not yet SAG. Um, one audiobook qualifies you. Um, there are, I, I know of some producers who you can work for without 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 being SAG. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how long you can do that or if it makes difference. It's, it's not there's not a must join situation. Yeah, uh, audiobooks, I think is the answer. And okay. um, like over over the years, I I think that actually um, actually it the the audiobook department uh, division of SAG has been extraordinary in creating win 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 situations for um for um audiobook narrators and for all of us because i remember years ago um you know talking with people who are extraordinary um lifelong narrators and they didn't have insurance mm. like it, it was not it was not a a, a jurisdiction and so now you can create a career in this and get paid and, and you know have have it be something that is something that you are creating a pension and you are getting health insurance and things like that. So it's it's a pretty it's a pretty cool pretty cool thing, I think. Um yeah, yeah. Oh, um, that's great. Um what's next? Kels? Um so we have um, Evan, how did you get started in audiobooks? What connections did you already have? And which ones did you realize were necessary to advance? And then what's the difference between audiobook and an audio drama? Okay, so why don't I answer, I'll answer the first one since that's my experience. And I'll let Karen answer the second half of that because she's probably got a better answer than I do. Um, oh, um Hi, Evan. Uh, I started because I I was looking for I was looking for work. <laughs> and I, That'll do it, right? Yeah, I I I didn't have any work, 
and I had coffee with a, a friend of mine who um who was uh who knew a lot of people in the like doing B and C B and C movies shot on low budget and I wanted to do some of the work that he'd been in and during the course of the conversation he mentioned that he did audiobooks um and uh so he introduced me to a producer which would be the same today as sending an email to a producer with with samples that you have you know he introduced he literally by email not even by email he took my resume my acting resume oh, and, nice. and then when he was when he was in the booth recording gave it to this producer who and so it was one of those things where where preparation meets opportunity this the the that producer was casting a book two weeks later casting a book and needed six black narrators because it was about you know um uh movements in in and in, in um black literature from uh con from you know 1800 to date and it was 1600 pages long um and so I went in and auditioned and got that book. And then he, because like many businesses, like many um, uh, subsets of our performing businesses, it is a relationship business. It mm -hmm. is a relationship business. And I, I leveraged his relationship with other producers to get introductions to them, to send samples, to send auditions, and that was in a day where the industry wasn't as big as it is now. So it was, it was, it was a little easier. Um, but I did something, you know, uh, there, I, mean, I think maybe I'd done one book for him. I did, I'd done two books for him. And then there was something in LA called speed dating, which was, which was um, uh, sponsored by the APA, which they still do, but they do now virtually, um, you know, as a member of the APA, you can throw your hat in because it's all um, lottery and they do it three or four times a year. And if you're selected, you do, you know, a pitch, you do a, a three minute pitch um, in front uh, online in a room like this, but you're the only, you and the, the leader of the, of the session are the only people that you can see, but there can be upwards of 20, 40 plus producers and publishers online listening to you. And it's the same thing, except it's, it's, it's much broader. Um, and so, it was doing things like that and then taking taking the um opportunity is not quite the right word um uh, really pushing myself to pursue relationships and to create relationships and go to the events whether virtual but in those days you know in person still in person those occur and creating relationships but having the material, the demo material and the stuff to show once those relationships were made, um, because it really is about it really is about relationship. You know, people people can't hire you unless they know you. And once they know your work, maintaining that relationship like you would in any business. The one the one regret that I have about my my career in theater and TV is that I didn't understand the importance of relationship with the people who um, can give me jobs. Um, and I made it a point to do that with audiobooks. And that would basically be just like, you know, staying in touch with that person. Staying in touch with that person, um, going to, you know, going to um, APAC, uh, which is the big audiobook con con convention every year, taking opportunity, using the opportunities, you know, if, if you coach with me, leveraging me, calling me and going, hey, is there anybody that you think would like my voice? Who can you introduce me to? Doing the same thing with all the connections. Yes, exactly. And, yeah. and, and also having, uh, I think, making sure that there's a, there's a different... Okay, what am I trying to say here? How can you do that with the focus on the relationship, not only on what do I, you know, like, hey, Roddy, who can you get me in with? You know, like mm -hmm. having that energy. What I've noticed about the 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 audiobook world as a subsection of the voiceover world. Um, so the voiceover world in general is very collaborative, very supportive, very all boats, you know, all tide rises, rises all of our boats. And the the audiobook community is very special. It's like 
really smart, cool people who work really hard. And, you know, so, so more about, more about how you can get to like, and once again, I don't want you to have a bunch of stalkers, Karen, but, um, <laughs> but um, hey, hey, Karen, what kind of cupcakes do you like? Um, but, you know, like, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, one of the words that we've been shifting at the dojo, we always do a lot of little semantic shifts. Like there is no they, there's only we is one that serves in everything that we do as performers. Um, and then little semantic shifts, sh shifts like um, formerly known as, if you think of what was formerly known as networking, as relationshiping. So how do you get to know somebody and how do they get to know you as a person and as an excellent narrator, right? Does that, does that all make sense? And, and if I just opened you up to to um stalkers <laughs> so don't stalk anybody <laughs> there's, an, there, there's an art to it i just want to follow, yeah. follow up because i think it's, yeah. it's really important and that is you if 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 someone if the only time you ever heard from someone was when they wanted something from you yeah in, in your relationships yeah. You, would, you would not maintain that relationship right it's not a, it's not about just showing up uh for when you want something you know there's there's something about understanding you know, um, the two way street being being interested and not just trying to be interesting, right. you know, and and also being authentic. There are some there are some people that I may meet in that environment that I have a real connection with. Right. And 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 then fostering that connection. And there's some people where it just it just it's like oil and water and not and then not trying to force that. Right. Understanding, mm -hmm. understanding where it flows and where it happens and making the most of where it does and letting it go where it doesn't, you know, so. Right. I like I this. Guess, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, I guess my only question at that point is how much of that is too much versus too little? The relation thing. I mean, this is like a whole nother conversation. But it is. I, I, will say, <laughs> I will say, I really like Katie's comment in the chat about how you know, you need to figure out how can you be helpful to folks? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. As a producer, the kind of email that I love getting versus the kind of email that I, that doesn't set me up to respond. So the one I love to get is, I have just narrated these titles for ACX or I like to narrate in this genre. I'm really good at this. Please keep me in mind if you have a romance title coming up, if you have a thriller. I'm really good at at nonfiction, uh, like medical medical titles. If you know what you're good at, I'm yeah. going to believe you. And I'm going to then have you in my mind when I have something that comes up that checks one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. The kind of email that doesn't really help me is... Hey, I'm available for work. And it just kind of doesn't really give me anything to work right. with so other than, oh, you're, if I don't know you, if I don't know you, that's what I'm saying. If you're kind of new to me. Right. Um, and as I was telling Tish in, when we spoke last week, what I really love is when narrators take a few minutes, they look at our website they see what we are, have coming up down the road, maybe in six months. And they say, wow, there's this great romance title. There's this sci-fi title I'd love to be considered for. And then get in touch with me about a specific title that we're doing. And if mm -hmm. I'm not doing it, then I'll send it out to the producer who is doing it. Uh, because if you're interested in it and feel like you might be good for it, then I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to at least consider you. Um, mm -hmm. I have to say that happens more often lately than it has in recent years because producers are working on a lot more titles. And if someone emails me and says, Hey, I'd be great for this title. It kind of, it helps me, right? It helps me. It, at least I, maybe I don't end up casting you, but it sets me, it already takes, takes one of the steps for me. So I'm going to check out this person and see if they are right for this title and sometimes they are, you know, sometimes the authors are like, yeah, one this is great. For you to do. Yes. Yeah. 
and then also be ready to roll. Like if you if oh, you're yeah. if you're going like uh hi I'd like to work with you, then make sure that you're ready to work at at Penguin Random House uh level, right? right? Yeah, uh, w which I'm assuming you 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 are you know you know that yeah, yeah um good 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 great questions and yes, uh Katie we should just frame what you said. Yeah. Having having the having the heart set of running your business from what can I give, how can I serve, rather than what can I get, what do you, what's in it for me, um, yeah. is that's that's how authentic business relationships are built and how they thrive, especially if those are the people that you want to be working with, because you might, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we won't we will we'll just leave it at that. Good job, Katie, <laughs> articulating the heart set. Um, Really yeah. lovely, really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Um, Do we have time uh, for another one? One more question? Maybe it, it is eleven fifteen. Do we have any more questions? Oh yeah, we got more questions. <laughs> That's <laughs> not part, part of the problem. We might have to do a sequel. Ask <laughs> <laughs> um, Audiobooks to Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, actually, this is a great one. I think this is a good one to end off on because a lot of people have questions related to this. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda, if you're available, you can come up. And if not, I will read it for you. Um, so I've done VO work in the commercial market. Um, so they have a commercial and an industrial demo. Would those demos suffice for getting started or do I need to create a demo to get my first job? And then there was also another question that was like, um, do I just need audiobook samples or do I need an audiobook specific demo? And just kind of expanding on um, demos in general. Audiobook demos, that is. Ronnie, what would you what would you encourage actors to do who are, have a more of a VO background? I like to hear... Uh, a, a sample from a book yeah. um, in order to kind of place that actor in audiobook land versus VO land. Yeah. I would, I think, I think the, I think that that's the, I think that's the accepted sort of in general intelligence about it. Because similarly, if you were trying to get a, a, a voiceover agent for commercial voiceover, you wouldn't send them a sample of an audiobook. Yeah. Right. And it works. It works the same way in reverse. People that are casting audiobooks are looking specifically to hear how you sound when narrating long form, you know, and they need at least a couple of minutes, not 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 a ton, but they need to at least a few minutes um, because they need to hear if you can carry a story. You know, can you know how to begin something? Do you know how to carry it? Do you know how to close a chapter? Do you know how to you know, do you have to bring things to life? And that's very different than 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 long form and other things. So. Um, yeah, I think you need, I think you need a demo and it's not, and there's different, you know, there's also a different format. You don't do a reel, you know, it's, uh, you have, you have, you may have different demos for different genres and different things that you play. Um, that's what, that's what, how I would answer that question. How about you, Karen? I mean, exactly the same. And, and in those words, if, if I could, yeah. And I actually this, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Karen, sorry. No, go ahead. Don't be nervous, done. Um, I was just going to say there's one more question that was super interesting um, that I would also like to know that we haven't really touched on. Um, what is, Hugh asked, what is the path to becoming an audiobook director? I was a booth director for a long time and am now a coach. Thanks. Hello. Hi. That's, um, that's the question, yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great question. I mean, for Penguin Random House, we work with... Um, a big network of freelance directors um, all over. Um, you can reach out to me if, if you'd like, and we can talk about um, the process of kind of getting, you know, onboarded as a director. There's usually a meet and greet with um, our staff member who um, interacts regularly with the freelance directors um, about any changes that we do or any, you know, she's our point person for that relationship with directors. Um, and um, yeah, if you have experience, then we're always looking for um, folks to direct. I'd be curious about, I mean, experience is one thing, but I have a set of transferable skills. 
Yeah, we we've definitely um started I mean, working with people like you who have transferable skills. So okay, they worked in podcasting or they were theater directors. Fantastic. Um so there's you know, we just kind of learn it by doing it. So there's a process that we go through. You'll maybe shadow a session, you know, talk to a producer, talk to another director. Right. Um, it start up with a small project and then kind of work your way, work your way up. A lot of our directors, you know, it's not, they're not only directing audiobooks. They do other things as well. In my experience, um, the... <laughs> the PRH directors are some of the most freaking amazing people <laughs> I've ever met in my entire life. I was saying to Karen on on the Dojo 21 questions, like one of my, I haven't been there for a while just in terms of how my life goes, but one of my favorite places in the world is the lunchroom at, at Penguin Random House because um, it's just such smart, awesome, cool, interesting people. But um yeah, Christina and Art, okay, mm -hmm. so many just great people. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tish. Yeah, no smoke. It's real. It's real, guys. These are good people. Um, yeah. Well, my dears, it's twenty after twelve. This has gone by so fast. Um, Ronnie and Karen, thank you so much for being here. Everybody, hope this has been helpful and nutritious and delicious for you um if you're just starting out in audiobooks it's it's a great thing to like recognize and if you're on your journey um hopefully you got some really good stuff that will keep you moving forward um we are always here for you to support in whatever way that we can um Kelsey has uh, added all of the ways to keep in touch with everybody. Um, do we have how to keep in touch uh, with with Karen? Yes. I think it was posted a little earlier okay. in the chat. Yeah, yep. I'm, I'm reposting everything. You want to go over what else we're, what else is going on, Kels, in terms of the dojo schedule? We have our demo listen derby coming up with uh, Brittany Cox and Ryan <laughs> Ricks. Um, Basically what that is, is you submit your demos to us and Brittany and Ryan and Tish will look them over and kind of see where you're at in terms of like, is this a demo that could get you booked or what does it, what work does it need? This is really helpful for people who have homemade demos, especially because then they can go, uh, it sounds like you recorded this with a potato kindly <laughs> or this sounds great yeah i would book you off of this yeah, yeah we, um, we, call it, we call it the demo listen derby because we have everyone deliver their things we we deliver things we don't submit to anybody um we deliver <laughs> um, mm -hmm. we deliver um and so we basically run it through run it through the gauntlet but not in a scary way like this is the mm -hmm. this is what happens when your demo comes to a producer or a production company or or something like that some real life life feedback, our opinions. It's it's a very illuminating, illuminating, uh, fun event. The demo lesson derby. So send yes, us your so, demos. Yeah, send us your demos if you don't. If you're like, uh, I don't have one, or I just want to know, like, if it's if if what it looks like to have a great demo. You can also just sign up to listen. Um, it is excellent, especially if you want to make your own at home demo, you can take notes and be like, oh, okay, this is what they're saying is competitive. And um, only if you have the production capability. Right. Um, we also have commercials with um, Jim Kennelly coming up. He is the owner of Lotus Productions. Um, and that Fight is, Club. Uh, yeah, Fight Club. There you go. Mm -hmm. And that is coming up next Tuesday. So be there or be square um and yeah our next uh you should do voiceover launch pad and workouts starts january 6th of next year so you know stop making your resolutions resolutions stop rewriting the same thing over and over and <laughs> come actually fulfill your dreams please <laughs> i i would love to see you all there um mm -hmm. yeah yeah so thanks everybody um we're here for you and to support in whatever way we can. I'm glad to create these places where we can come together. Um, Ronnie and Karen, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy audiobook days. And you. 
to all sorts yeah, of thank uh, you. Photo collaborations and thank um, you. have have great have a great um great day everybody we'll thank you see. so much this was great talk to you thank soon you. Bye, yes guys. thank bye you guys. all so much bye bye, -bye.